Have you ever wondered how firemen extinguish flames when there aren't any fire hydrants? Geographically speaking, the vast majority of the United States is completely void of fire hydrants. How do departments in these non-hydranted areas function? First, let's take a moment to talk about why we use water and the science of how firefighting actually works. Disclaimer, this video contains math. Not boring math like you were forced to do in school, but exciting practical math that will help solve real world problems. The fire triangle represents the three elements required to support combustion or allow things to burn. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. Remove any one of these elements and the fire will go out. Let's look at a few examples. Often, the best method to extinguish a stovetop grease fire is to simply put the lid on the pan. This causes the oxygen to be used up by the combustion process, or in other words, removes the oxygen element from the triangle and the fire goes out. The same principle applies here with this candle. Placing a lid on top causes the oxygen to be completely consumed by the flame. Once the oxygen level drops below that which can support combustion, the flame is extinguished. This method of firefighting is not well suited to a structure fire as a house is never inside an otherwise airtight container just waiting for the lid to be put on. If fire involves a flammable gas, like the methane coming out of the burner on this stove, the fire can be extinguished by simply removing the fuel, which in this case is natural gas. Removing the fuel element causes the fire to go out. This method of fire extinguishing is also not well suited to a structure as a house is generally constructed and furnished with combustible material, which in this context is the fuel. That leaves us with the third and final side of the fire triangle, heat. If enough heat is removed from a fire, the flames will go out. Remove is kind of a misnomer. Heat is energy and that pesky law of thermodynamics doesn't allow us to create or destroy energy but it does allow us to move it around or transfer heat from one substance to another. To better understand this concept, let's drop an ice cube into this glass of water. What is happening to the temperature of the water? It is decreasing. But what is happening to the temperature of the ice cube? It is increasing. That's because when we take heat energy away from one object, in this case the water, that energy must be put somewhere else. And in this case, it's into the ice cube. The same principle applies to firefighting. Water can be used to remove heat from a fire, but for every unit of heat energy taken away, that heat must be transferred somewhere else. And in this case, that somewhere else is water. When we cool the fire, there is a corresponding increase in water temperature. Firefighting makes hot water. Can a cup of water be used to extinguish a raging fire? No. A cup of water can be used to extinguish, of course, a small fire before it intensifies, or the same cup of water can be used in the aftermath of a large fire to put out the final remnants. But while a large fire is raging, a cup will be insufficient to affect the fire behavior in a meaningful way. Firefighters have to bring lots of water. Big fire, big water. How much water is enough? To answer that, we first need to understand how to quantify the amount of heat being produced. One way to measure heat energy is the British Thermal Unit, or BTU. It is equal to the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. I do not know the metric equivalent, but well, that's because in America, we use freedom units. Everyone knows that the standard unit of measure is superior to the metric system, but I digress. How much heat or how many BTUs can one pound of water remove? I am glad you asked. We're actually getting to what I consider the most exciting fact about theoretical firefighting. 
what I refer to as the real magic. It's actually math and science, but it feels magical. How much heat energy can one pound of water remove from a fire? Let's assume our one pound of water is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. We all know that water boils at 212 degrees. Above this temperature, it's no longer liquid water. So let's remove a single BTU from the fire and put that into our one pound of 60 degree water. The temperature of the water will increase by one degree. If we add another BTU, now the water will be 62 degrees. And if we put another 150 BTUs of heat into the water, it will reach 212 degrees. With a single pound of water, we were able to remove 152 BTUs from the fire, and now our water has reached the boiling point. Water is a pretty cool substance. At 212 degrees, it can exist as a liquid, or it can exist as steam. So how do we convert one pound of 212 degree liquid water to steam? We add more heat, of course. So it turns out it's really hard to turn water into steam. Steam conversion requires a lot of energy. The latent heat of vaporization is the term used to describe this process. You can see this phenomenon by placing a thermometer into a pot of water with the burner on high. The temperature rises steadily until it reaches 212 degrees. The burner is still on high, putting plenty of heat energy into the water, but the temperature no longer rises. The temperature of the pot cannot rise above 212 degrees until all the water has boiled away. This energy used to make the 212 degree water boil, though it is no longer raising its temperature, is the latent heat of vaporization. How many BTUs does it take for one pound of water to make this conversion from 212 degree water to 212 degree steam? 970. So while it took only 152 BTUs to raise our pound of water from 60 degrees to the boiling point, it took 970 BTUs or 6.2 times more energy to convert that water to steam. Why is this so exciting? Because if all the water used for firefighting is turned to steam. It would take six times fewer fire trucks, six times fewer hoses, six times fewer firefighters to handle those hoses, and six times less water to extinguish a fire. Now the reality is that much of the water does not get converted to steam. But if water is a big concern, special nozzles can be used, and water can be controlled in such a manner as to convert as much water to steam as practical. Now there's actually a fine line here is converting too much water to steam while inside a structure can have its own dangers. But in general, steam conversion is a great method to reduce water consumption during firefighting operations. How much water do firefighters need to extinguish a fire? It is of course impossible to calculate the exact amount of heat energy being released by any given structure fire. But there's an easy formula that you use to estimate the necessary amount of water known as fire flow. So let's take a standard 1200 square foot family home using the formula length times width divided by three, extinguishing a fully involved 30 by 40 building would require 400 gallons of water per minute. How much water can be delivered by a single fire hose? That answer varies, but most attack lines in the United States are either inch and three quarter or two and a half inches with the former being the most popular pre-connected hose line. Flow through an inch and three quarter can vary wildly, but 150 gallons per minute is a pretty good rule of thumb. Since the needed fire flow is 400 gallons per minute, they're going to need a minimum of three of this size hose line. Alternatively, a single two and a half inch hose line could provide the needed fire flow. 400 gallons every minute is a lot of water. That's 3,320 pounds every 60 seconds, or 24,000 gallons per hour. This is typically no big deal when connected to a pressurized fire hydrant. But as mentioned earlier, the vast majority of the country has no hydrants. So if there aren't any fire hydrants, where does this water come from? Rural fire departments bring their own water. 
So there's one big difference between city and rural fire trucks. A city truck may only have a couple hundred gallons on board, as they expect to connect quickly to a fire hydrant. Rural fire departments, on the other hand, typically carry at least a thousand gallons. Many fire engines even carry up to 2,000 gallons. This amount of water is heavy and takes up a lot of space. And the amount of water a fire truck can carry is a trade-off between big tanks carrying lots of really heavy water versus the ability to drive on unpaved roads and traverse long, narrow driveways. The bigger the tank, the heavier and generally taller the truck, which makes it less mobile and more difficult to get the fire truck to the places it needs to go. However, there is more than one type of fire truck. There are engines, also known as pumpers, which are what most people think of when it comes to a fire truck. These have a big pump that's powered by the diesel engine, a series of hose lines, ladders, air packs, and other necessary firefighting equipment. And often, they have a large cab capable of transporting four or more firemen. Then there are tankers, also known as tenders or water trucks, depending on what part of the country you live in. The primary purpose of this type of truck is to transport or shuttle water as efficiently as possible. Then quickly dump the water and go get more. A tanker may or may not have a large pump similar to that of a fire engine. But let's back up for a second. The most simple, least manpower intensive method to deliver water from a tanker to an engine is by simply connecting a hose from the tanker to the engine. This method is fast, easy, and less manpower intensive compared to the complexity of setting up a portable tank. But portable tanks get used all the time, so they must have an advantage, right? So we earlier established the need for 400 gallons per minute to extinguish this fire. Most tankers carry between two and 4,000 gallons. Let's just assume ours carries three. In this theoretical response, someone called 911 reporting a house is on fire and two fire trucks arrive, an engine carrying 2,000 gallons and a tanker with 3,000, giving us a total of 5,000 gallons of water. At 400 gallons per minute, that provides firefighters 12.5 minutes before they run out of water. That is not enough time. Plus, we don't want to use all of our water we'd like to try and keep a thousand gallons in reserve to protect the firefighters inside the building and to give them ample time to retreat in case we do run out of water. So once empty, the tanker is free to disconnect from the supply line, drive the couple of miles to a water source, fill up and return. We call this one cycle. Let's just say this tanker can complete a cycle in 12 minutes, but because their water is being pumped to another truck, and only being drained from the tanker at the rate of about 400 gallons per minute, the tanker must remain on scene and connected to the attack engine for at least seven and a half minutes. Add in another minute for connecting and disconnecting the hose, we can add this 8.5 minutes to the cycle time, leaving us with a total time of 20.5 minutes. In the 20.5 minutes it took the tanker to complete one cycle, our needs were 8,200 gallons but the tanker only brought us 3,000 gallons. That means the firefighters ran out of water. Another way to express what is happening here is by delivering 3,000 gallons every 20.5 minutes, the tanker can only deliver 146 gallons per minute. As the incident commander, you really want to provide continuous flow. How can you make that happen? There are two factors that will help ensure continuous water flow. More tankers, and shorter cycle times. If we just bring more tankers, even with the same 20.5 minute cycle time, we can provide lots more water. However, more tankers can add to the chaos. Plus, connecting and disconnecting hoses slows things down, and it can make for a bit of a hassle for the fire engine operator, as he has to work at providing continuous flow to the attack hoses, but is not receiving constant flow into the engine. While this can be overcome, it increases his workload significantly and increases the likelihood that the amount of water flowing to the attack hoses will fluctuate or even cease, at least momentarily, which can be quite dangerous for the firefighters inside the structure. However, if we introduce a portable tank, this is better in almost every way. 
It reduces cycle times for the tankers, as they can dump their entire volume of water in seconds without ever getting out of the cab. Then they can be on their way to get more. This alone can reduce the cycle time by at least six or seven minutes. Plus, the attack engine now has a steady supply of water. No more transitioning between water sources every few minutes. The workflow can be reduced further if we introduce a supply engine whose only job is to draft water out of the portable tank and deliver it through a large diameter hose to the attack engine. This arrangement is typically used on a long driveway lay where it's impractical to back tankers all the way up the driveway. This arrangement allows tankers to dump water from the road and go while allowing the attack engine to be connected to an intake hose that is functionally identical to a pressurized fire hydrant. The same tanker that took 20.5 minutes can now complete a cycle in only 13.5, which equates to 222 gallons per minute. Not enough to meet our target of 400, but adding a second tanker into the mix will give us a theoretical fire flow of 444 gallons per minute. The reality is that this margin is pretty thin and doesn't allow for much delay or error, so a third tanker would likely be added just to help ensure continuous water flow. This entire operation requires many moving parts, all working together like the gears inside a finely crafted watch. It is complex and takes place in a dynamic environment, and in my opinion, is quite impressive to watch. So let's take a quick look at some rural firefighting operations. Here you have one engine on scene and a second engine just now arriving. And there is no water supply established. And so quickly you can see at the engine near the bottom of the screen, there's this yellow porta tank. They're just beginning to set it up. And they take care to make sure that the porta tank leaves at least one travel lane open so they can get the water trucks in and out and don't create a bottleneck. And before long, here comes a tanker ready to dump water into that, into the porta tank. And you'll notice the tankers tend to have a shape where you can see their tank and they're kind of no frills compared to the engines. Also, most of the fire engines you'll see have a double cab, which is four doors and room for at least four firefighters, where most of the tankers don't have that, and there's only two standard doors and enough room for two occupants. And so this turns out to be a pretty complicated scene here, where they have two attack engines and they set up two porta tanks, and they seem to have lots of tankers. So the tanker on the right, you can see him leaving, he's empty he's going to get more water, which for this scene was only about a mile down the road at a lake. And again, you can see yet another tanker is dumping water into that porta tank. Now, most of these tankers have the ability to dump the water from inside the cab. But either this one doesn't have that technology, or maybe it just has it for the side dumps and not for the rear. In either case, once things have slowed down a little bit and uh, your water delivery rate has decreased, you can kind of take more time and be a little more miserly about dumping your water to make sure you don't spill any. So, you know, there's two colors for fire trucks. There's red and there's wrong. And you can see some of the wrong colored trucks in this clip. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how to fight fire in rural America. Thanks for watching. Questions, comments, put them below.